Thank you. Fantastic. Well, welcome aboard uh, to Aldous and Broadus and our 2020 fall homecoming. My name is Chris Randolph. I'm director of development here, and we are thrilled you all could join us today for our second lecture in the uh, Dr. Robert Digman lecture series. And although we are doing this in a virtual capacity, uh, no matter what platform we use, anytime AB family and friends can gather together, we consider it a joy and a blessing. And we thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for uh, today's lecture. Uh, just one housekeeping item. If you wouldn't mind utilizing your uh, chat function on Zoom, uh, possible, let us know who you are. Give us your name, uh, where you're Zooming in from, and if applicable, your graduation year from AB. That way we can kind of have a, uh, a roster of who uh, joined us for today's lecture. As many of you know, this lecture series was named after Dr. Robert Digman, and uh, Dr. Digman was for many years an esteemed faculty member here at Aldous and Broadus uh, and greatly contributed to the intellectual life of AB. And this lecture series honors his academic uh, career and legacy. And uh, we had Dr. Digman join us yesterday, and he is doing well, and uh, we are uh, thankful for his years of service. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for Jess. Jess and I were in school together as students, and I got to know her and respect her uh, both as a fine musician and a great educator, and also have gotten to uh, count her as among my good friends over the years. A few words on Jess. Uh, Jess earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Applied Voice from AB in 2002. She graduated summa cum laude and was a member of Pi Kappa Lambda. Jess has a passion for working with underserved populations who sing and teach musical styles that are generally excluded from academia. After earning her master's degree in classical vocal performance and pedagogy, she dedicated herself to studying how the voice works in contemporary, commercial, and popular music styles. She became an assistant faculty member of the CCM Vocal Pedagogy Institute at Shenandoah University and created singing and popular musics uh, for voice teachers in 2016. In addition for running a private studio online and in Columbus, Ohio, she teaches workshops on contemporary singing across the country. After earning two degrees in classical music, Jess left that world and returned to her first loves of soul, jazz, pop, and R&B. Her effortless voice, poetic lyrics, lush harmonies, and playful rhythms weave together into dreamy art pop infused with soul and jazz. She appeared on American Public Television Songs at the Center, NPR's Mountain Stage, and was a quarterfinalist in the 2015 and 17 American Traditions competition. Jess was the winner of numerous awards while at AB, including the Jack and Virginia Kleinard Vocal Music Award, W. Lee and Alberta M Williams Music Award, the Music Academic Award, and the Student Leadership Award. I think, Jess, you pretty much beat me out of all of those, so <laughs> you got all of them. She was also a member of the Silver Key Society. We are thrilled to introduce and welcome you to Jess Baldwin. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so great to see everyone today. I'm, I'm really honored that you've chosen to spend this time with me today. I hope you're enjoying beautiful fall weather wherever you are. No matter where in the world I am on a crisp fall day, I always wish I was driving the curves of a West Virginia road, surrounded by gentle waves of fiery tree chops, crisp air flowing through the windows, headed down to Arden Road to take in some sun on Party Rock, or maybe out to the 4-H camp for the annual music retreat. October days seem forever wedded to the energy of AB's music department, buzzing through the chapel on a homecoming Saturday. Miles of rolling hills blazing through the iconic Starburst Chapel window as students and alums fill the hall for a transcendent musical experience. Alderson Broadus remains a magical place in my memory, not so different from the magic I love about the world of Hogwarts in the Harry Potter series. The professors were brilliant, powerful, caring, wise. My fellow students and I learned how to put people under the spell of music while battling the evils of oversleeping and underpracticing and the sight reading assignment that shall not be named. 
And just as Hogwarts was Harry's first introduction to the magic within him and to a place that felt like home, so AB was for me. Music was always a huge part of my life, and so was school. With a high school choir director for a mother, I spent my days and my nights in school buildings. Thankfully, I loved being a student, and I loved experiencing and making music in my mom's choir rehearsals. It was there that I developed many music skills without it ever feeling like actual practicing. I started piano lessons at age six, and as soon as mama realized I could play some of the choral octavos, she had me start accompanying the choir on a few songs in each concert. She would often have me teach parts to the sopranos and altos during after-school rehearsals. And at our Presbyterian church, I sang in children's choir, the Point of Grace cover group, and the adult choir. And I played and sang in the worship team and played in the handbell choir. Piano was a big part of my life, partially because it was a service many people around me needed, and also because I loved it. I won the West Virginia Piano Competition a few times, accompanied the West Virginia Allstate Choir twice, and attended Brevard Music Center for piano. I thought for a while that being a concert pianist was in my future, but I later realized I didn't want to sit at piano for six hours a day. I had too many other interests both in and out of music. When a friend's brother, who taught at the Indiana University Music Department at the time, listened to my college audition pieces for both piano and voice, he said, you are a very good pianist, but that voice is something really special. It was an important moment for me. He saw past what was useful or helpful or even skillful in my piano to something that was truly unique about me. His comments would eventually free me up to focus on my voice as my primary instrument. It was a very natural progression to go to college for music Specifically, Western European classical music, which was and still is the standard for what is taught in K through 12 and in academia. So much so that it's just called a music degree at most schools in America. Sadly, this is one of the ways white culture is considered the baseline or standard or norm while all else is a deviation. Uh, since I'd been studying classical music and piano lessons and school choir and church from a young age, I had a place to be in academic study. Many young musicians in other genres were not and are not so lucky. They often face the choice of either assimilating into classical music or not having the opportunity to study their preferred music in music education or in an academic setting. This problem would weigh heavier and heavier on my heart over time and would later drive a great deal of my focus as a future teacher. But at that time, I wasn't thinking about any of that just yet. During my time in college, I was enjoying the thrill of diving into solo vocal study for the first time. I was finally able to work at my own pace and learn how to stand in my power as a singer. I was starting to understand what it meant to feel more alive because that was what I experienced as I dove into texts and harmonic analysis and vocal technique with fabulous teachers and mentors and performed for attentive audiences in beautiful spaces. I loved the thrill of collaborating as a pianist with my peers, receiving more coaching from their great teachers and learning how to shape not only a song, but a whole experience. It really did feel like we were learning magic. I excelled in both degrees and was encouraged to pursue classical performance as a career. At the end of grad school, this is what I was doing as a solo artist. I'm going to share a little few clips with you guys here and there of, of my singing through the years.
we don't need to start it again. So that was the end. <laughs> Thank you. That was the end of my grad school career was at that recital. Existing alongside all of my academic music training was a part of my musical self that felt as though it was supposed to exist outside the walls of whatever was professional or academic. And that was my deep love of listening to and singing jazz and an eclectic mix of popular musics. I have my parents to thank for much of it. Mama always split the fall choir concert between Western European classical music and contemporary gospel music. She also did a pops concert in the spring where the students picked their own songs and she directed and produced an annual musical and somewhere in there too. I adored singing the gospel, pop, and musical theater tunes she picked. At home, mom's Saturday playlist would commonly go from Robert Shaw to Take Six to John Rutter to Michael Jackson to Natalie Cole. I had the entire Unforgettable album memorized. At dad's house, his favorites were guitar greats like Chet Atkins and Les Paul, jazz from the first half of the 20th century, and bluegrass, which he remembers his Floyd County, Virginia grandparents calling string music. My stepmom was crazy about disco and soul and Willie Nelson. I loved listening to the latest R&B hits. Once I went to college, an indie rock artist buddy introduced me to indie music magazines and it blew up my listening world in the best way. Now I knew where to find new music that wasn't on the radio or on MTV. I would buy different magazines best of lists and then go check out stacks of CDs at a time from the library to hear the albums for myself. In my late 20s, I was introduced to 70s jazz fusion, 21st century jazz and minimalism. And I still to this day use any music, anydecentmusic.com and NPR and Ted Joya's list to put together a few hundred albums that I listen through um, every year to figure out what some of my favorite stuff is for that year. So all of these influences slowly grew, reaching for light and sprouting around the stepping stones of my classical training. You may or may not know that being a classical singer generally means learning how to fit into a pre-existing mold, since the music being sung has been around for a very long time. The music you'll sing, the opera roles you'll play, the choir parts you'll sing, what your voice can and should be, these are largely dictated to each performer. The authority on the legitimacy of a performance ultimately lies outside the performer. And to travel the path to success, they continually submit to someone else's authority to know whether they are meeting the standards of the music. As a young person who had a deep need for approval from authority figures, classical music was a perfect place for me to be. I liked the technical challenge of fitting the mold as perfectly as I could, getting into the minds of the composers who had created the music and doing my best to bring their works to life in the ways they would have wanted. I enjoyed being the vessel for their art. Popular musics, on the other hand, are meant to continually break molds. The authority on the legitimacy of a performance ultimately rests in the heart of the performer. Alongside humanity's never-ending struggle to overcome oppression by the rich and powerful, it has also created something their oppressors had no authority over, their music. Performers and creators of popular music closely guard the ability to maintain their freedom and authority in this realm. They decide who they want to be and how they want to sound. In America, popular musics are also woven with the Western value of maintaining individuality. But for me, breaking the mold meant having no idea who or what to be or what standards to meet or how to know if I was doing it right or wrong, or whose approval to even seek out. And speaking my truth meant potentially upsetting or even losing people in my life, at least how, that's how it felt at the time, and that was too terrifying for me to risk. But somewhere in there was a seed. I first knew it was there when I read The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron for the first of many times in 2005. I knew immediately that it was calling me to write my own songs, my own words, my own music, but I had major creative blocks to work through first. In addition to having trouble putting my thoughts and feelings and stories into lyrics, I'd just spent seven years studying the great classical composers 
and felt like it was futile to write anything in the face of that greatness. I started connecting my voice and my extracurricular music life and that little seed buried deep down in there somewhere by first singing jazz standards and jazz fusion and pop and funk and soul in some cover bands. The more I gave jazz and popular music a place in my artistic identity, the more I struggled with the thought of letting go of classical music. After all, it was where I started to find my voice and fall in love with singing. I had put so much time and money and work and all of my teachers believed I was destined for great things in that field. But the more time I spent in other styles, the more I realized that I had always felt like an outsider in professional classical music spaces. They were just too formal and uptight for me, a little too bourgeoisie. I'd never felt that in my school settings because both were full of very down-to-earth people. But the minute I stepped into a Nats competition or an opera or a symphony, I felt a little uncomfortable. I performed in multiple styles for a while. In 2012, I put together a program of all living female songwriters and composers, half modern jazz, half classical. I used some of this material to then enter into the multi-genre American Traditions competition in 2015. I made it to the quarterfinals. In their comments, the judges were wowed by my jazz and musical theater pieces and kind of lukewarm on the classical one. Knowing that I could wow these professionals in my untrained genres allowed me to really give myself permission to change how I saw myself. Meanwhile, I was learning that a huge part of being an independent artist is being able to market yourself. And if you don't know who you are and what your sound is, your marketing will be muddy and people won't have enough information to decide whether they want to learn more about you. I needed to start figuring out who the heck I was as an artist so the people who would be into my sound could find me more easily. It would take me six years from my first reading of The Artist's Way to start writing my first arrangements, which was a gateway for writing original music. I started by resetting an art song from grad school by Samuel Barber and then a classic jazz standard. So let me share a little bit of those with you guys. Barber turned into a jazz arrangement and then Over the Rainbow which was a very special song in my family.
little bit of those. So first foray into arranging, usually jazz stuff uh, was how it was coming out at first. Then I wanted to head in a more pop soul direction. So my friend Jared Mahone, another AB alum, helped me arrange and produce this favorite Weezer tune of mine. delved into pop more which was super fun uh, in addition to my arrangement writing helping me figure out my style and prepare for writing originals I tried my hand at setting other people's poetry before I could finally put my own lyrics to music in setting poetry I learned a lot about how I set text and I learned that for me I needed to start with a harmonic and rhythmic song foundation before I inserted melody and lyrics. I finally wrote my first songs when I was invited to appear on a nationally syndicated American public television series called Songs at the Center, which features songwriters. I don't think the people who invited me knew I hadn't written any actual songs yet, but they obviously liked what they'd heard me do up to that point, so I took the gig and make sure I had three songs ready for the taping. Home was the song that made it to the actual broadcast. So I don't have the actual broadcast. Uh, whoop, sorry, shared the wrong thing. I don't have the actual broadcast, but I do have a recording of the tune. She takes refuge in the shadow of the cross fire. They're throwing silent grenades across the aisles. She silences her soul and hides behind a smile. She can't find sanctuary. In this holy house She's looking for home Searching for a place to rest Somewhere the heart can open up And not be ashamed of the mess Some solid ground to hold her steady When life puts her to the test Looking for a place where she can be fearless. So that was my first tune, first set of songs that was showing up in the world. Now, I do not recommend having your very first songs be introduced for the very first time on national television. But sometimes that's what gets the work done. Ultimately, my writing was what gave my inner artist away. I never wrote in a classical style for my voice. I wasn't purposefully avoiding it, but it's just not what wanted to emerge. So I started following my writing voice and I'm still on that journey, figuring out what I like and don't like and what naturally wants to emerge. As I prepared these words for today, I, I thought I was gonna focus more on my work as a teacher since it's been a huge part of my life, but the truth is that my teaching life has always been an extension of what I needed as a person and an artist. After working with hundreds of teachers over the years, 
I've come to believe that most teachers are just extending their own healing process to other people. It's not so different from parenting. We wanna help our students avoid our mistakes and have advantages we didn't have. And we can only help our students grow to the extent that we have been willing and able to grow ourselves. At each stage of my artistic and personal development, I adjusted my teaching to reflect the growth I'd experienced. When my inner artist wanted to explore non-classical musics, I attended the Contemporary Commercial Music Vocal Pedagogy Institute in 2009, and then every year after that, they brought me on faculty in 2016. When my inner artist felt out of place in classical music academia, I left my academic teaching positions and started seeking out the independent teachers who were working with non-classical singers. I developed a vocal pedagogy blog called Singing in Popular Musics in 2016 and invited those teachers to contribute. As my inner artist was working through the physical and emotional blocks caused by complex PTSD, I was drawn to help people who were working through the same stuff. I made space for their trauma in the studio and I started referring students to somatic psychotherapists. Likewise, as I was experiencing the release of these trauma-related blocks, I was ready to work with people who were starting to emerge on the other side of their work. As my inner artist realized I couldn't build a life around black music unless I was also willing to stand up for the value of black lives, I started incorporating more anti-racist practices into my studio and seeking out other teachers who wanted to develop anti-racist practices in their studio as well. Most recently, I realized that it was time for my inner artist to stand on her own. My teaching identity, much like a parent, has been supporting and nurturing my artist, and it was time for them to be very separate identities. Not surprisingly, my new favorite thing is helping voice teachers whose inner artists need to develop separate from their teaching identity and people who are ready to take the big steps toward artist independence. As I heal, I can help others heal. I have to admit that telling my story in any setting always feels weird. It's very similar to the feeling I have when I create my art, and again, when I share my art. Somewhere in there, the voice of trauma says, who cares? Who are you to think people listen to what you have to say? It's true that there will always be people who don't care and people who don't want to listen. There will be people working through their own trauma and believe that the need to be seen and heard and understood is selfish. There are going to be people who just aren't into me. And that's okay. Because there are times I don't care. I don't want to listen. I struggle with my own trauma. And I'm just not really into that person or their art. But in the end, we have no choice but to share our story through our art. It's the only thing we can really offer our unique version of what it's like to have this human experience. And this thing that trauma wants to tell us has no value is incredibly powerful. And the power lies in the moment that someone hears our story and feels seen, feels less alone, feels understood in their own human experience. The person that needed it will be grateful we shared, even if the presentation isn't flawless. Sometimes the flaws themselves are exactly the story they needed to hear. So to finish, I'm gonna share my latest work with you all. It's another one of my arrangements. I'm gonna share it in fullness. Uh, this time it's a Bjork tune and designer Andy Hall has created a really great lyric video for it. It has not been officially released yet. You guys are actually the first to see it, so you get a sneak peek. Um, so here is Alarm Call. Oop, let me give you the beginning.
As you can see, Jared had his hands in this one as well. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so thank you all for letting me share my story with you all today. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> all right, so let's see. Uh, we can open things up for Q&A if anybody has questions. Yes, thank you, Jess. I, I think I can speak for everyone. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for sharing your voice. Thank you for sharing your story. We have a few minutes. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Jess? Make sure you unmute yourself as well. We have everybody muted right now. So if you have a question, just make sure you unmute. I'll start with one serious question. Is there anything you can't sing genre wise? <laughs> it's very nice. Yes, <laughs> definitely. I, I cannot sing metal <laughs> to save my oh, life. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not even. Are close. there are, are there any genres that you that you have been hesitant to explore, but there's something in you that says this keeps grabbing me, but I just haven't quite done it yet. Actually, from a pedagogy perspective, I do want to explore metal some more yeah. uh, because I have a decent people, amount of people who want to come in and they want some grit and yeah. noise and dirt in their voice. And um, there's a fabulous master teacher named Melissa Cross who does teach mm -hmm. those methods and um, how to do that without actually shredding vocal folds. Although some people like to have like some amount of damage on the folds on a permanent basis to help them be able to make those sounds the way they want to, which as long as it doesn't keep getting worse is fine. Like there's no problem with that. Um, but she teaches how to, how to do that in a sustainable way. So I would like to go study with her and learn some more of those techniques. Um, but yeah, from a performer perspective, you know, I mean, I'm often perceived as having this like, this sweetness, this softness about me, like my music can feel kind of dreamy sometimes. And then I, at the same time, I'm like, but I can be loud and I got things to say. So a little bit of that of like, I'm, yeah, let me do some metal and just scream at people for a few songs. That would be very like, <laughs> cathartic I, I think you know which is the point of the music for a lot of people is the catharsis of really letting the voice out with all the emotion that they want to let out um i'd pay but, to, you know i'd pay to hear it <laughs> <laughs> you'll get the first tickets <laughs> any other questions from anyone Okay. Well, before we let you go, uh, I do. Is that someone? Thank you from the Digmans. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm Thank I you. Saw, I saw where they joined. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Jess, um, where can we find you online? JessBaldwin.com. Awesome. Yeah, JessBaldwin.com, and that'll lead you to my, it's a portal page, so you'll have, there's a teacher portal um, that'll take you to JessBaldwinVoiceStudio.com, which is my teacher stuff, and then the other one will take you to my art, released music, YouTube videos, things like that. And certainly as we're going through this pandemic, artists are struggling, we're all struggling, so please find Jess online and listen to her and check her out more there just thank you again for your talents for your contributions thank you everyone for joining us today for this uh, uh lecture series thank you dr digman for your years of service and uh josh i'll turn it over to you but i think we have one more lecture uh tomorrow but it is pre-recorded correct correct we do have our next digman series tomorrow um we will have it released at noon it is Vicki Alkire. She's one of our alumni award winners this year. And it's a question and answer uh, format that we will have and to learn a little bit more about what she does and everything as well. So please join us then. The rest of our events are, are on ab.edu slash homecoming. 
But personally, just thank you again, Jess, for, for doing this. This is great. She did pre-record, or we are recording this. So um, with her permission, we'll be releasing this again for those who weren't able to make it because we have had some that reach out to me and say, are you recording it? I can't make it, but I'd love to hear it. So again, um, we appreciate all that you've done. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. <laughs>